Thank you. Thank you for taking the time on a beautiful Sunday evening to come to a very important topic, war in the Holy Land. My name is Bill Cruson. I serve as a pastor here at Chelton, a church of hope, and I'm also a professor at Cairn University in Langhorne, Pennsylvania. After October the 7th of last year, a number of people at this church asked me for my thoughts about the attack. So the pastors of Shelton agreed that I should address this topic. But I offer this disclaimer. I am not speaking for Shelton, for Cairn, but rather I'm presenting my own personal opinions and I hope to give all of you enough information about the background to this conflict, as well as offer a Christian perspective. Some information you hear tonight will no doubt be new to you. The issues are complex, very complex, and our time tonight is limited. I hope that you will be motivated to investigate these issues on your own after this. So I would like to share with you uh, what I've learned after many years traveling to the Holy Land, in particular the land of Israel. I've led tour groups to Israel and Jordan for the past 35 years. My doctoral work focused on Jewish and Christian relations in the early church. I have taught a course on the history of modern Israel on a university level. I have friends who are Palestinian Arabs, Israeli Jews, and friends in America who are Arabs and Jews. And I would like to say I'm honored to have my friend Rabbi Adam Wahlberg from Temple Sinai joining us tonight. We actually talked a bit about what I would say and what he told me as part of our presentation tonight. So some of those people told me that this issue is much bigger than October the 7th. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, you all know that we can never understand any current event without knowing the history behind it. So when we see a story about Hamas murdering Israelis, or we see children dying by Israeli raids in Gaza, we cannot properly interpret those actions without knowing the history of the Middle East. So my goal tonight is to give you some of that history so that you can have a framework, a context, to understand the current events. So my plan tonight is to answer three questions. No, sorry, five questions. First, what is the Holy Land? Second, what led to the founding of the State of Israel? Why did it come into being? How did that happen? Number three, what has happened in Israel during the last 75 years? Four, how do Christians, the Christian church at large, view Israel and the Jewish people? And then finally, I will share with you my personal conviction on this topic. Now, I have to tell you that the first part, points one and two, are very heavy on history. You're going to hear a lot of information and... Uh, I just don't want you to be overwhelmed by anything. But in order to understand what's going on now, uh, we have to do this. And then we'll take a short break after points one and two, then we'll come back and finish. So first of all, what is the Holy Land? I don't know what you think about when you hear that term. This satellite view shows you the piece of real estate that we're talking about. Many of you know that if you compared it to a state in our country, it would be something like the state of New Jersey. 
So I would like to answer the question in three ways. How is the Holy Land holy for Jewish people, secondly, for Christian people, and third, for Muslim people? First, for the Jews. This land is considered holy because God promised Abraham this land for him and his descendants and for the nation that would come after him. That nation was later called Israel, the new name that God gave to, Ab to Jacob. We find this in Genesis chapter 12. I won't read it. You can refer to that later. Its borders are described later in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, essentially from the river to the sea, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, the land that then was conquered by Joshua, settled by the 12 tribes, and later David established the kingdom of Israel with its capital in Jerusalem, and he planned to build God's temple there. His son Solomon constructed that first temple on the very place where God had appeared to Abraham years earlier, scripture tells us. This sacred space is mentioned by the prophet Zechariah. In fact, it's the only time in scripture, holy land, that phrase is found. Zechariah 2.16 says, the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. So you can see from scripture that God established his chosen people in this particular area of the world at the time of Joshua into the kingdom of David and Solomon. But something happened. Next came other kingdoms. After about a thousand years of the Israelite presence in that land, if we go, say, from Joshua all the way to the time of the Babylonian invasion in 586 BC, that foreign nation came into the land, wanting to include it in its larger empire, destroyed the first temple, and exiled the Jewish people to Babylon. That's what we call a dispersion. After that, as you might know, another empire took the place of Babylon, Persia. The king of Persia, Cyrus, allowed people, Jewish people, to go back to the land to rebuild the temple, but not many Jews went, only about 10% of the population. They did return just to Judah, and they did rebuild the temple that is called the Second Temple. Then the Greek kingdom came and conquered the Persians and occupied the Holy Land, destroying, sorry, uh, trying to follow my notes closely here. They occupied the Holy Land until the Jewish people, led by the Maccabees, fought to regain their freedom. And uh, many of us know about Hanukkah. That celebration is based on the cleansing of that second temple then in about 150 BC. But that freedom lasted only about 100 years. And then in the year 60 or so, the Romans came in, invaded the land and occupied it and eventually destroyed that second temple in the year 70 of the Common Era, or AD 70. And they later drove all the Jews out of the Holy Land, or Judea, which became another dispersion. You had the Babylonian, now the Roman. And in order to try to obliterate the memory of the sacred name of Israel or Judea, the Roman Emperor Hadrian renamed the land Palestina, Syria Palestina, the ancient writers tell us, in order to take away forever the ancient name of that homeland. And so that name, 
Palestine is still used today. Pagan Rome ruled the Holy Land, now known by the new name of Palestine, until the year 300, but the hope of all Jews in the dispersion was someday to return to their land despite it being occupied by foreigners. So I'll pause that on the Jewish way, the Jewish reason that uh, they consider the land holy. And now I'll move to Christians. For Christians, the land is considered holy because Jesus was born there. That's where he lived and died and resurrected. In fact, that's where the Christian church was born in about the year 30. The New Testament book of the Acts of the Apostles describes how the earliest Christians, by the way, all Jewish, sought converts first from synagogues and then from the Gentile communities. The Christian church then expanded throughout the Roman Empire. At first, it was persecuted as an illegal religion. But when the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, which no one expected, many things changed. And so the name of the new empire, which is still the Roman Empire, is the Byzantine Empire. What did Constantine do? He set in motion the Christianization of the Holy Land. From the year 300 to 600, the Byzantine Empire ruled. They built churches over places where Jesus had done miracles or was born or was died or resurrected or ascended. Many of you have been to the land of Israel and seen those ancient spots. I'd be curious, and maybe you all would too, how many of you have ever traveled to Israel? Would you just put your hand up high for a moment? Yes, that's good. Thank you. That's one of the joys, one of the many joys. In fact, someone said tonight, where's the food? Yeah. And you know me and Middle Eastern food, right? So I'm thinking, yeah, we should have had uh, falafel, hummus. Oh, now I'm getting hungry. No, but one of the joys of going to the land of Israel or the Holy Land is not just the food, but seeing these ancient places that are marked, at least for the Christians, by churches built to preserve their memory. But in the year 600, and I'm using round numbers tonight, a new religion called Islam was born in Arabia and their armies soon captured the Holy Land from the Christians. So now, third, let's talk about why the land is holy for Muslims. Can you see how complicated this is getting already? For Muslims, the land is considered holy because Islamic tradition states that Muhammad, the prophet, ascended to heaven from the Temple Mount. That's why later they built the Dome of the Rock over the rock of the Holy of Holies in the Second Temple, and they built the Mosque of Al-Aqsa on the Temple Mount. Both are still standing in Jerusalem today. That began a long period of Muslim rule over the Holy Land. You see that from the year 600 until about the year 1000, various caliphates or leaders in the Muslim world included Palestine in their rule, whether it was in Cairo or Damascus or Baghdad. Different families controlled the Holy Land. But something was brewing because one of the Egyptian fanatical caliphs wanted to destroy and actually did the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the church that was built over the place where Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. 
That created furor in the Christian world, you can imagine, and that's what prompted, in about the year 1000, the Crusades from Europe. Those Christian crusaders tried to regain the Holy Land, especially Jerusalem, and they did, but they could only hold it for about 100 years. It was a constant struggle, and then the Muslim Arabs came back again, attacked the crusaders, and in about 1100 then began another Arab rule of the land. That rule from 1100 went all the way to about the year 1500, when another Muslim people, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, defeated those Arabs and began their control of the Holy Land. And that lasted for 400 years. Now, it's amazing. Here we are in a country that's a little over 200 years old, and I'm talking just in seconds about blocks of 200, 400, 1,000 years. The Turks bring us into, could we say, our modern world because their rule lasted 400 years, but it ended in the 20th century. So welcome to what may sound now a little more familiar to us. The Ottoman Empire, if you look at this map, was huge. Uh, in the uh, late 1800s, it stretched all the way down, included Palestine, down to Arabia. And you may know your World War I history, and you know that the Turks joined the Germans, the Axis powers, against the Allies. And so when World War I ended and Germany and Turkey lost, Turkey actually lost all the area that it had conquered. What that meant was that the winners divided up the spoils. The British and the French took a map, took away those lands, and I'm just now talking about Turkey, and they said, France, you can have this part of the Middle East, and Britain, you can have Palestine. And so began what was called the British Mandate of Palestine. Here's what it looked like. You can tell they were using rulers on their tables. Right? They're not rivers. They're boundary spots. They're oases. This is desert in the country of Jordan, mostly. And what you see then on the right-hand side was really part of what's on the left-hand side in 1918 when the United, uh, sorry, when the League of Nations decided to give as a mandate Britain caretaker or control over this part of the world. Very soon after it was given to Britain, Britain gave that part of the land, the darker, what is it, gray color, it's called Transjordan, to one of the Arab sheikhs, King Abdullah, for his help in helping the British defeat the Turks in World War I. If you want to know more about that, I suggest you watch the movie Lawrence of Arabia. It's a four-hour movie, <laughs> but it's one of the classics, and you'll learn a lot about the time. Now, Great Britain faced increasing tension with a rising Jewish population. Why would that be? Well, that's because Great Britain had a man who was the foreign secretary named Lord Arthur Balfour, who wrote a letter, and I'm sure he didn't think it would be this famous, but it is now called the Balfour Declaration where he told the Jewish people, especially in Great Britain and around the world, 
that Great Britain, who is now controlling Palestine, will give as much as they could, they would give to the Jewish people a homeland, an ancient homeland. This was written in 1917. The war had just ended. In this letter, I know you probably can't read it, he says, while we favor the Jews, we also favor the Arabs and don't want to do anything to upset them while both are happening. Well, that was easier said than done because on the ground, it created tension between the existing larger Arab population and the new influx of Jewish immigrants. And although a small number of Jews always lived in Palestine or the Holy Land, all the way back under Islam, now with increasing numbers of Jews coming from Russia and Europe, Jews and Arabs on the ground in Palestine began to battle over that land. So my next question is, question number two, what led to the founding of the state of Israel? And I have uh, a few things to say here. First of all, Zionism. You've probably heard of the term. This was a movement to create a Jewish state in Palestine spearheaded by, you see his picture there, Theodor Herzl. He was a secular Jew, a newspaper reporter. He was not religious at all, but he was feeling the persecution in Austria and in Europe and said, enough, we've got to have our own homeland. So he took it upon himself to write a book in German, Der Judenstaat, The Jewish State where he created a vision of a country, he didn't say it first in Palestine, but a country where Jewish people could go free from persecution and develop their own Jewish culture. Zionism, though, has its roots in the promise to Abraham that is repeated throughout the Hebrew prophets. Listen to just one example from the prophet Ezekiel. Quote, God speaking, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. Unquote. Chapter 36, verse 24. It was always an embedded hope of the Jewish people to go back to the land. Even the words of the ancient Passover Seder end with next year in, can you finish it? Jerusalem. Zionism fueled Jewish immigration to Palestine under the Ottoman Turks, and then it continued in the British mandate period. So this rising immigration contributed to the creation of the state of Israel, as well as to the Arab tension because of the increased number of Jews in the land. That's the first thing I'd like to highlight. Secondly, the Holocaust, or as Jewish people call it, the Shoah. An increasing number of Jews during this time in World War II attempted to immigrate into Palestine to flee Nazi persecution. In fact, you see there a picture of a ship called Exodus 1947. It was a ship hired to carry Jewish survivors of persecution and even survivors of the Holocaust so that they could leave Europe and go to Palestine for safety. You may know the story. Have you seen the movie? When they got there, the British Army refused to let them in, made them leave the ship, and eventually the ship went back and the people were transported, can you believe it or not, into the very Nazi death camps that they had been liberated from months earlier. That's just one small story. The immigration 
was there, but the British now had turned from the British mandate that said, we welcome, and we will foster a Jewish state in 1917 to what was called the White Paper of Great Britain in 1939 that said we will limit immigration to a trickle. The growing hostility between Arabs and Palestine and the increasing Jewish population led the British to finally say, we give up, almost like a babysitter with two kids and they can't wait for the parents to come back because they can't control the kids. And Britain said, we've had enough. After 30 years, we're finished. They planned to pull out. And in doing so, they created a partition plan where both peoples would have two states together. That's what it was called, the partition plan. This is what it looked like. It was drawn up. There were some negotiations ahead of time, but eventually this plan was put before now the United Nations. And you see the darker color was to be the Arab state and the lighter color to be the Jewish state. Only politicians could draw states with three non-contiguous parcels, right? <laughs> but at least it was something. And the UN voted in 1947, November, to partition it based on this map. And I would call that the original two-state solution. It was. And lo and behold, the vote went through. You see there, 33 to 13, overwhelmingly passed in the UN. The Jews were thrilled to finally have their own state after more than 2,000 years. But the Palestinians rejected the proposal since in their own words, they did not want to coexist side by side with the Jewish state. They either wanted all of the land of Palestine or not. Nothing. Now, if you go back, let me just go back on that slide. The Gaza Strip, can you see that on the left there? Um, on the bottom left of the gray, right up by the Mediterranean Sea. The Gaza Strip was to be part of that Arab state, that southern part. So, continuing the story, on May 14th, the British had finally pulled out, and on May 14th, the state of Israel proclaimed its independence, and the very next day, I'm sorry, May 14th, the very next day, May 15th, five Arab armies declared war on the new Jewish state, hoping to drive them into the Mediterranean Sea. Their words. Instead, Israel won this war. And for Palestinians, they still remember it as the Nakba, the catastrophe. Well, why would they say that? Because there was no Palestinian state. In fact, this map, this is the 1948 armistice lines, this map shows the Jewish land bigger than what the UN proposed. It was only bigger because the Jews had to fight their way to peace. And then finally, ceasefire was called. Now, I must say, there were two groups of Palestinians fighting with those Arab armies. Some fled during this war, and some stayed in the land. Those who fled were never permitted to return, and today the Gaza Strip is filled with the descendants of those Palestinians who fled from the southern areas of Palestine in 1948. I hope that helps, because some of you might be thinking, 
hold it, why are so many people crammed into such little space? That's why they were refugees. Egypt would not let them cross their borders. No Arab state allowed them entry. They were forced to stay in the Gaza Strip, and Egypt controlled the Gaza Strip in 1948. The same thing is true today. They had rebuilt the wall from the south of the Gaza Strip into Egypt. They still have that same policy. However, those Arabs who did not flee from the state of Israel during that war were and are Israeli citizens. And I remember when I first heard this, I thought, well, I thought Israel is all Jewish. No, it isn't. Here's the latest figures. The total population of the state of Israel is almost 10 million people. 27% are non-Jews. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the state of Israel gives citizenship and benefits to those Palestinians who, and their descendants who never fled. I have friends who are Israeli Arabs. They may have cousins who are Palestinian Arabs living in the Gaza Strip or the West Bank. Do you see why the Middle East is hard to understand? Should I say that again? The state of Israel is not 100% Jewish Israelis. The Palestinians who did not fight stayed were granted citizenship by the state of Israel. And they make up over 20% of the population. Some even serve on the Supreme Court. There are political parties that are Arab parties that Arabs can vote for or Jews can vote for. So it's a, it's a little bit of a mess. Maybe not a little. So let me review, like maybe a teacher should do, what did we look at? The first thing we talked about the Holy Land is why is it holy? Or to whom is it holy? It's holy to three religious people, peoples, to Jewish people, to Christian people, to Muslim people. Those are competing claims for the same real estate. Then we ask the question, what about the state of Israel? Because we're getting to the Gaza issue, but you have to talk about the state of Israel. Where did that come from? We talked about Zionism and the Holocaust and the British mandate and the UN vote. Now, my next point, my third point, these will go quicker, is what has happened in the last 75 years? Yes, the state of Israel has been around about 75 years. And now I'm going to, we're slowing down in our chunks of history, but I'm going to rapid fire talk about some events. There were two major wars that actually threatened the viability of the state of Israel. When you talk about a war, it can be a war somewhere else, like America fought, let's say, World War II, not inside America, but in Europe. It was not an existential threat to our country, not then. But these two wars were fought inside Israel and designed to wipe Israel off the map. The first one was called the Six-Day War, because that's the number of days in which it was fought. Israel won, and they, at that time, gained control from Egypt of the Gaza Strip. Remember, we're talking about the Gaza War. I have to keep myself and us focused on just that topic. About five years later, the defeated Arab armies, with the exception of the country of Jordan, said, we lost in 48, 
we lost in 67, we will not lose this time. And on the most holy day, Yom Kippur, they invaded. They invaded and Israel almost lost the war. At least that's the way the record reads. But eventually, with the help of America, by the way, Israel won. They beat Syria and Egypt. Jordan stayed out of that war. And that was the last existential threat to the country of Israel. After that, that was 1973. You advance about six years, and finally, peace breaks out. Now, of course, during those six years, there were negotiations going on both secretly and outwardly. And our presidents helped to arrange some of these peace treaties. So perhaps you remember uh, 1979, Egypt, of all countries, they were the, most, they were the, the leaders in the 73 war, in the 67 war, and they were the leader in peace. Anwar Sadat made peace with Menachem Begin. It was all over the news. It made a lot of people in the Middle East and Arab nations upset, so much so that he was assassinated shortly after the peace treaty. That peace still holds today. Now, about, uh, what, 15 years later, after many negotiations, King Hussein, who is now deceased, his son rules, Ab Abdullah, um, named after his grandfather, but King Hussein made peace with Israel in 1994. Maybe you remember, now we're getting, we can remember it on the news maybe, uh, with uh, Bill Clinton, wasn't it, or Jimmy Carter, oh boy. No, Jimmy Carter was 79, I think it was Bill Clinton in 1994, King Hussein and uh, a number of Israelis, former soldiers, by the way, one of them said, it's hard to make war, but it's harder to make peace. An old soldier knows how to make peace. Oh, sorry, let's advance the slide here. And then in the year 2005, after more peace negotiations, Israel decided to withdraw from the Gaza Strip. Remember, Egypt had it first, lost it in 67, Israel, Israel withdrew in 2005. And then, just a few years ago, I know you remember this from the news, right? The Abraham Accords. Israel made peace with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. All Muslim countries, all Arab countries, all formerly at war with Israel, now signed on to an official peace. Amazing. And discussions, if, you, uh, if your short-term memory is really good, in 2023, you remember the news. Saudi Arabia is ready to sign on to peace with Israel. Can it be? Saudi Arabia, the place where Mecca is, the protectors of the holy places. And yes, they were. And many people think that because of that, that is what triggered the war on October the 7th, to, de to derail the Saudi Arabia uh, peace with Israel. Now, why would that be? And again, I better be careful I don't just keep talking and talking and talking. But what I'm talking about, you can hear on the news, and this is not... These are objective facts as far as I know. It's Iran, Shia Islam, that hates Saudi Arabia, Sunni Islam. And there's this competition going on, and they would do anything they could to derail peace. And so Iran is hoping, and it happened, right, that Hamas ruins the peace plan. Palestinian Authority, which is 
the Palestinians in the West Bank, recognized Israel's right to exist in 1993. This is not on the slide. Palestinian Authority, West Bank, Yasser Arafat. They did the unheard of. They said Israel has a right to exist. Well, Hamas, or Hamas, as it's pronounced in Arabic, is a radical Islamic group that has power now in the Gaza Strip. And their charter states, quote, Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam will obliterate it, just as it obliterated others before it, unquote. Hamas believes in the total destruction of the country of Israel. Much like Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas wants Muslim rule from the river to the sea. Have you heard of that before? <laughs> we talked about that when we talked about the Jewish scriptures giving Israel the land from the river to the sea. And so October the 7th will go down in Israeli history as maybe the third war. It was not technically an existential threat but it was such a surprise, and here I'm speaking now with no knowledge of anything except speculation. I'm sure that in the next year or two or three, things will be uncovered to find out what went wrong. How could that have happened? I don't know. But it happened, get this, on the day after the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, October the 6th, 1973. What could be more humiliating? As of today, Israel's counterattacks are receiving world acclaim as overly aggressive, leading to the death of thousands and thousands of Gaza civilians. This war would probably end if the hostages were immediately released, I suppose. The latest I read this morning is they're working on a deal. I don't know if that's going to end the war, but currently Israel is searching for those hostages and in turn looking for Hamas soldiers who hide among civilians inside or under schools and hospitals, making Israel's hunt for them particularly difficult and especially tragic for innocent civilians. It's a mess. People are suffering. Next, how do Christians look at Israel and the Jewish people now I want to back up a bit and give us a theological perspective on two different ways that Christians for 2,000 years have thought about Jewish people and the state of Israel. All right, so uh, for some of you this is going to be new, for others of you you've heard of this before, but I'll start and say there has been a view called, and there is, replacement theology or supersessionism, that's the scholarly word for it. What does that mean? This view teaches that Christians have totally replaced the Jewish people in the plan of God. Christians have superseded the Jews. This view is uh, held widely and has been held widely in the Christian church from, could we say, a very strong supersessionism that would border on anti-Semitism. In the early church writings, you have 
Sad to say, Christians saying Jews are Christ killers. And in the European medieval times, even in Hitler's Holocaust, using writings like that, even Martin Luther writing things like that as a justification for killing Jewish people. So you've got a spectrum. You've got mild and strong supersessionists. Someone who is mild or uh, not you know, anti-Semitic would be Gary Burge, a professor at a Christian university in America, who's written a number of books, his latest, and perhaps the one that uh, would be easily uh, digested by all of us, is called Jesus and the Land. Here's what the book cover looks like. Subtitled, The New Testament Challenge to, quote, Holy Land, unquote, theology. So, in this book, he explains why he and other Christians have disagreed with the idea that I've been presenting, or at least I've been suggesting, that Jewish people have a right to the Jewish land, where he writes, those who try to reclaim holy land or to reconquer territory in the name of God, he says, Jesus envisioned a different era, a different kingdom, where old territorial claims, backed by religious privilege, were no more. So here is a fellow Christian, a brother, who would say the Jewish people have no religious or biblical or spiritual right to the land of Israel. I honestly don't know if he thinks they have a political right that's a different issue, but I'm talking about the divine right to the land. Now, that view, this view, can be traced, as I said, all the way back in the early church to the earliest documents we have. And it has caused, through the centuries, much Jewish and Christian hatred, distrust, some of you know that more intensely or personally than I do. But if you read the history of Christian anti-Semitism, anything in the name of Islam that's happening now looks minor. Can I say that again? The Christian church has been guilty for millennia of anti-Semitism of the worst sort. I'm putting it out there. I'm sorry, I'm sad, but that's the truth. Although anti-Semitism is not an integral part of this theology, some say that it's a logical outcome from the conclusion that the Jewish people have no standing with God because they rejected Jesus. The logic goes like this. Jewish people rejected Jesus, therefore God rejected the Jewish people. Therefore, so should we. And I hope you find that revolting. There's another view that has been found in the Christian church, again, going way back as early as we can find. Some have called this restoration theology. Maybe a new name for it would be Christian Zionism. This view holds that the people and the land of Israel continue to have significance in the divine plan, including the modern state of Israel. And there is a <clears throat> Christian scholar who has written this book, again, wouldn't take too long to read it through, written on a good level, called Israel Matters, subtitled, why Christians must think differently about the people and the land. The author himself writes, I had been convinced that the church is the new Israel. This meant that the covenant that God made with Israel was transferred to those who believed in Jesus. Then he says, 
I will never forget the day that I stumbled upon Paul's insistence that the Jews who rejected Jesus were still beloved by God and that God kept his covenant with them as his people. Unquote. There are a number of books that are written defending this view of Christian Zionism. And again, in a, in a short talk like this, I can't tell you everything, but there is a spectrum between very strong Christian Zionists who, let's say, would say, anything and everything the state of Israel does is good and godly, and others that would not hold that view, but at least believe that Jewish people have a right to live in a Jewish land. And so I'm wrapping it up with, what's my perspective? I started by telling you, this is me talking tonight. It's not our church. It's not the university where I teach. And so my answer is that I hold to Christian Zionism. And I'd like to tell you why. First of all, I believe that it's what the scriptures teach. For instance, here's one of the Jewish prophets, Jeremiah. What do you think he means? Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. And as far as I know, the sun was setting this afternoon. And as far as I know, the moon and the stars are out there tonight. And as far as I know, the people and the nation of Israel exist. But it's not just the Jewish prophets. It's the Jewish apostle Paul, where he wrote in a letter to the Roman Christians about 2,000 years ago, after talking about this very question, do the Jewish people still have significance in the plan of God? His conclusion is, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Not personal enemies, but hope you understand that. But as regards election, they are beloved, well-loved, for the sake of their forefathers. Forefathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And Paul concludes, because the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. That's why I'm a Christian Zionist. Because I think, again, this is my opinion, the Bible is telling us from both the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures, and our New Testament, that God still has a covenant with the Jewish people. And if God still loves the Jewish people, they are his beloved, why would they not be ours? So I believe also that anti-Semitism is an ancient sin and it continues to threaten Jewish people around the world. I mean, what do you think the book of Esther is all about? The Persians wanted to wipe out the Jews, but they could not because God made a promise to Abraham. Racism in every form is a sin and unjust and wrong, especially anti-Semitism. Now, I believe that even if all the above were not true, that the Jewish people still have a political right to their own nation in their ancient homeland, just based on the politics of it. But I add that in as another reason. 
Scriptures teach that wars will always continue around the world, always. And there will be a final conflict, I think, in the land of Israel at the end of time. But how close are we to that? Only God knows. It is not for us to speculate about what might happen when the end of the world is coming. No, it's for us to trust that God is always in control, even when it looks like he's not. That's what we're learning as we walk through the book of Daniel here on Sundays. God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. One caveat, this means that I certainly do not give a blanket endorsement of everything done by the state of Israel, either in the past or during this war. Just because you think they have a right to defend themselves and live in the land doesn't mean everything they do is right. But as Christians, we believe that every government is imperfect and makes mistakes, don't we? Including our own. So what, <laughs> so what can we do? I'm wrapping it up now with five points. I hope that you will all continue to learn, to learn accurate news, to read both sides, to learn to sift truth from untruth, and to put news in context. Keep talking, keep learning, keep listening. Secondly, don't just listen to the news. I think it's important to listen to other people. That's why a few weeks ago, I contacted my friend Rabbi Adam and said, I'm planning to do this. Could I talk to you about it? And immediately he said, yes, I'd love to talk. He had just come back from a trip to the Gaza Strip and to the state of Israel and told me firsthand much of what he had seen and heard and experienced. I learned from that. We have had a friendship for years, haven't we? I also have friends who are Arabs, both here in America and overseas. I had a Zoom call with one of them. He lives in the country of Jordan. He happens to be a Christian. His parents left in 1948 from Ramallah on the West Bank. They were Palestinians. Now they are Jordanians. And I listened for an hour as he told me stories and I asked him questions. I learned by listening. I learned from stories. This is a great time, not to go in with an agenda, but to be a friend and to sit down and have coffee or lunch or just, just talk. Third, as Christians, we should be peacemakers first, but we should always be realists about evil that must be stopped. Now hear me on this. In fact, one person emailed me this, I quote, it seems unjust that the IDF is ruining most of Gaza, yet how should Israel defend itself against aggressors in Gaza when they embed their army in the civilian population and have sworn to eradicate the Jewish state? Can you feel the tension there? Is it right to go to war to fight evil? That has been called the just war theory that the West has believed for almost 1,700 years since it was propounded by St. Augustine, the just war. Not just defending yourself, but seeing evil and going at it to put it down. That's something to think and talk about. But what it means is, I'm choosing the word lament 
In the middle of all this, we must lament the suffering that is caused by, and Christians can call this with a word from scripture, sin, evil, injustice, on both sides. We can lament. And you may know that the book of Psalms contains half of them as laments. It is a good and proper thing to do that. Number four, as Christians, we have a weapon. And it's not a weapon of this world. It's called prayer. And we should pray for peace and pray for justice at the same time. This means praying for the hostages, praying for the Israelis who are suffering and live in fear, praying for the Palestinians who are suffering and living in fear during the war, and even praying for the leaders of Hamas, that they would repent and find the truth One person who lives near the war zone that I talked to to prepare told me that what I just said, trying to pray for both and sympathize for both sides is really hard to do, especially in their context where they're on one side of the ethnic divide. As Christians, can we get our arms around both and say there's a third way? There's a gospel way that the good news of Jesus is good news for Arab and Jew alike. And the way of Jesus is the way of inner transformation of people's hearts, not the sword to take off someone's heads. We should learn that from the Crusades. The gospel, the good news about Jesus, brings real inner change. And I know that that's happening. I just know it. Even though I don't know it objectively, that's the way the gospel goes out, person to person. That's what we should pray for and work for. So I want to thank you for coming tonight, for your attention to this very important conflict I gave you a lot of information, and now it's up to you to continue to learn and to come to your own conclusions. May we all continue to learn, to ask questions, to pray for our God, that his peace and the knowledge of the Prince of Peace will fill the earth. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we thank you that we know you by your revelation in Scripture. And we know you by your Spirit that you have poured out into our hearts. And we thank you that that personal relationship with you is available to anyone on the planet and always has been. So we thank you tonight that we have gathered so many people from so many different backgrounds. And we would pray that we would be like Jesus taught us to be, light in a dark world, salt in the midst of corruption, that we would pray for justice, but we would also seek peace. Lord, we pray for all the leaders involved that there might be very soon peace in that part of the world. And help us in our own relationships with others to find that same kind of peacefulness as we meet new people and have conversations. May we be bringers of your kingdom now, since we know the Prince of Peace, and we look forward to his return in glory someday, when every nation will know you and all Israel will be saved. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you.